Um, like to uh, welcome everyone to the the uh, the MIT Club of Boston's uh, first installment of our uh, Boston seminar series for 2021, uh, featuring Professor Ed Roberts. Uh, my name is Meg Dreisick. I'm the one who sends all sends all the emails and uh, answers all the questions. And I'd just like to say a, a few words uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the MIT Club of Boston. Uh, we are the oldest alumni, MIT alumni club, and uh, our mission is to, to reach, serve, and engage all MIT alumni and students in the greater Boston area, and to foster a lifelong intellectual and emotional connection between the Institute and its graduates, and to provide MIT with goodwill and support. And of course, uh, since the pandemic, with all of our events being virtual, we have expanded that far beyond the greater Boston area. Um, we're now uh, welcoming attendees um, worldwide. We have a few, just uh, before we get tonight's event going, um, we do have a few upcoming events that I want to make sure people are aware of. Again, all virtual, so join in from anywhere. Uh, the next meeting of the book club will be thurs um, Thursday, January 21st. Uh, we'll be reading Educated, a memoir by uh, Tara Westover a universal coming of age story that gets to the heart of what an education is and what it offers. Um, and after that, the book club will meet again Saturday, February 6th, reading Endurance by Alfred Lansing, um, the, uh, an account of, of Shackleton's uh, voyage. That's in, in February. And the dining club has started up again, uh, again, virtual. Uh, Friday, January 22nd, uh, it will be hosting a virtual dining event with uh, MIT alum Peter Sexton, uh, featuring two beloved Mexican dishes as prepared by award-winning chef Patricia Ginich, I may be pronouncing that incorrectly, and host of uh, host of Patty's Mexican Table. On Saturday, the twenty-third, there will also be a Scotch tasting tour of Isle, um, featuring a sampling sing and. The recommended samplings are from Lafroig and Beaumore. Uh, I think that's that brings us up to date for January and February. And of course, we will oh, we will also be having an event in February on the, the 13th, a virtual Chinese New Year celebration uh, for Year of the Ox. In the past, we've always we've done um, we've had a tradition of, of getting together for dim sum on this day. We can't get together, but we do encourage everyone to just order order their favorite uh, dim sum and, and join us online. So I think that uh, again, that that brings us up to date with all the MIT Club events. Please check out our website and uh, follow us on on Facebook. To keep uh, keep in touch. And I would now like to hand it over to uh, Bonnie Kellerman, our uh, uh, VP of uh, and Development and many other many other roles in her years with the MIT club so okay so, and she will introduce our speaker so uh, Bonnie thank you Megan um, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight Ed Roberts who is the David Sarnoff professor of management and technology at MIT Sloan School he was the founder and is now the co-chair of what used to be called the MIT Entrepreneurship Center now called the Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship one of his most recent accolades was he was awarded the 2020 Legacy Award of the Global Consortium of Entrepreneurship Centers for a lifetime of pioneering entrepreneurship. He's the author or co-author of 16 different books, and he will be talking with us tonight about his most recent book, Celebrating Entrepreneurs, How MIT Nurtured Pioneering Entrepreneurs Who Built Great Companies. Please know that he has decided to dedicate all of the author's proceeds from this book to support entrepreneurship programs at MIT. Professor Roberts is the co-founder of so many MIT programs and startup companies that if I told you about all of them, we wouldn't have time to hear his presentation tonight. So go back to the invitation to tonight's event to see all of the different things he's been involved with. 
But without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for tonight, Professor Ed Roberts. Take it away, Ed. Thank you. <clears throat> thanks, Bonnie, and thanks, Megan, uh, for your introduction. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, what wasn't mentioned is that I have four MIT degrees, so consequently, I am an MIT lifer, and I'm thrilled to be able to talk to an audience of MIT alums. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about tonight is how the MIT entrepreneurial ecosystem, and we'll talk about what that means, has over the last 50 years been developed and what kind of impact it has had. I'm gonna talk about three different types of impacts. Number one, the impact that entrepreneurship has had on MIT itself. Secondly, the impact that MIT has had, particularly economically on our region and on the United States. And finally, the impact that MIT entrepreneurship has had on the rest of the world. So that's the sequence and I'm gonna tackle them in order. Uh, let me start with the beginning of all of this, which took place on an unplanned basis in 1963. My class is class of 57, course six. Class of 50, 63, one year after I got my PhD in economics was 62. In 1963, as a second year assistant professor, I started doing research on companies that had been formed by people who left MIT laboratories. We started with the instrumentation lab, we went to the Lincoln lab, we went to other major MIT labs. Then I shifted to academic departments. I wanted to see the differences between the companies started out of the science departments versus the engineering departments. Then I finished with MIT and I started dealing with looking at government labs outside of the area, who has come out, what are the nature of the companies that have come out of that. And finally, I convinced two major corporations in the then Route 128 area to let me go in and study companies that had been formed by people who left each of those major large corporations. Now, when I say I, I mean I and my research assistants and thesis students from all across MIT. And we started this in 63, the very first research program ever in the field of technology-based and innovation-based entrepreneurship, no prior precedents for doing research in this area. And over a period from 1963 up till 1920, I'm sorry, till 1990, essentially, I was alone in running this kind of activity with my grad students. We had no other faculty whose focus was on entrepreneurship. And I might make a side comment, a very few senior faculty thought it was a good idea that I was focused upon entrepreneurship. They thought that I could do better things if I was working on other kinds of materials, which I was anyway. I was doing system dynamics work. I was working on managing R&D and innovation, but I was focused on entrepreneurial studies. And during that period of time, we studied every aspect of entrepreneurship. We studied the founders themselves, their characteristics, their backgrounds. We studied the forming teams and the problems that existed with them. We studied the nature of product development in a beginning team. We studied the entry into new markets. We studied growth problems of a firm. We studied the financing issues. We interviewed venture capitalists and did major studies of venture capital decision-making. We did a lot of stuff in the year in the year 1990, I published a book called Entrepreneurs in High Technology, Lessons from MIT and Beyond. The book was entirely based upon my research of all of those years. Every chapter was research-based. So we weren't merely talking from experience. By then, I had a lot of experience. But we weren't talking from experience. We were talking primarily from data and attempting to argue what it is we have learned about every aspect of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship and the growth and development of it. Now, while this research was taking place, other things were happening at MIT. In the beginning, of course, as an assistant professor, I was doing my darndest to write, to speak, to talk at seminars at MIT, to talk at engineering groups in the greater Boston area. I even addressed the MIT Alumni Association on the nature of my research findings in the lab and the like. I talked at every one of the labs where we did studies to report back to the labs what we found and the people in the labs heard these things and the like. As a result, we began to develop 
a broader group of people interested in the notion of entrepreneurship. And several of us, seven to be exact, in 1969, finally got to the MIT Alumni Association and convinced them to let us do a pilot seminar program over one weekend called How to Start Your Own Business. They didn't want to do this because they didn't think it was a great idea. We thought it was a great idea. We said, okay, if we can get 30 alumni to sign up for a weekend program, we're going to argue that an interest group in entrepreneurship ought to be formed by the MIT Alumni Association. We sent out invitations for the weekend uh, to classes that were essentially ages 27 to 35, which was the hot time period in New England only. When we passed enrollment of 250 people with our target of 30, we decided to cut off enrollment, have the program in Kresge Auditorium and announce in advance that six months later, we would run a repeat of the program for other people that we hadn't admitted. We also constituted our group as a national committee to begin programming, creating this seminar and replicating it across the United States through MIT alumni clubs in eight different cities over a period of three years. Over that period of three years, with the exception of me, every other person participating in all these cities was local. And they filled in all the slots we had created in our program. Somebody who could talk about founding, somebody who could talk about founders, somebody who could talk about money, somebody who could talk about product development, you name it. We were able to do that recruiting with the help of each of the eight different alumni clubs. And we rolled this out over three years to over 3,500 MIT alums across the United States. The most successful alumni program ever run by the MIT Alumni Association. That program had spin off. So two years after we got started, the New York Alumni Club started the New York Venture Clinic. The New York Venture Clinic was to take and help New York alumni who were trying to start new companies and to give them advice and guidance and the like. Two years later, the Cambridge Group started the MIT Entrepreneur uh, Enterprise Forum of Cambridge. The New York group liked our title better. So the New York group changed its name from the New York Venture Clinic to the MIT Enterprise Forum of New York. And suddenly we now had two. So we were together and we decided to start a rollout of the MIT Enterprise Forum. At its peak, we had 26 chapters of the MIT Enterprise Forum worldwide, spread all over the world, attempting to encourage and help MIT alumni in starting and building new companies. So that was what was taking place. But in the meantime, at MIT, except for my research going on, there were no events taking place that were entrepreneurial. There were no changes in the organizations at MIT that related to entrepreneurship. One year after my book published in, 19, in 1991, I finally persuaded the Dean of the Sloan School to let me start the MIT Entrepreneurship Center. Not the Sloan School Entrepreneurship Center, despite the fact that my Dean was very quick to tell me I was a professor at Sloan, and therefore why wasn't this a Sloan Center? My argument was the marketplace for entrepreneurship that we wanted to reach was MIT as a whole, not just the Sloan School. And Besides wanting to know who else believed in this, we got started, it got approved in 1991. And that was terrific because once we had a center approved, I was given the right to start to hire faculty. I was given the right to start to build out new courses. We went from essentially one or two courses in 1991 to today, over 60 courses. Let me give you perspective. Before we started in 1963 with my research, there was one course at MIT, started in 1961, called New Enterprises, taught by a successful practitioner. All entrepreneurship in the United States and in the world was taught the same way in those days. A wealthy, successful practitioner said, here's how I made my millions of dollars. All you need to do is copy me and you can do the same thing and you can be just as successful as I was. So all entrepreneurship education was practitioner education based upon the experiences of one or two people telling everybody else how they could go about doing it. 
When I started the center, I persuaded the dean that we were going to do something different. We were going to do what I called dual track entrepreneurship education. One track of practitioners and experience, the second track of academics who were doing research and study in the field of entrepreneurship. And I held as my ideal that in the same classroom, a practitioner and an academic would be co-teaching to the students who were interested in learning about entrepreneurship. The first dual track entrepreneurship program any place in the world. That was 1991. Okay, what happened after 1991? Well, the answer is nothing for 10 years. 10 years later in the year 2000, collaboratively, the MIT Entrepreneurship Center and a bunch of faculty from the engineering school got together and created the Venture Mentoring Service, housed in the provost's office, so as to make it clear they were all MIT, because the MIT Entrepreneurship Center was sitting in Sloan School territory, so that didn't make it clear to everybody else, despite all of our efforts. So here, this was a collaborative effort to create a venture mentoring program, and that venture mentoring program was done together, jointly, MIT Entrepreneurship Center and leadership in the School of Engineering with the help of the MIT provost. The next year, the next two years, 2002, the second of what became a cluster was created. The chairman of the board of MIT was Alex Darbeloff, a great entrepreneur of Teradyne. Alex, as chairman, convinced Desh Deshpande, a non-MIT alum, to give MIT $20 million to start the Despande Center for Technological Innovation. The Despande Center was going to do something different with its money. The income was going to be used to fund faculty research that was judged to have high potential for commercialization. That's not the usual standard for generating research activities and sponsorship within MIT. Within MIT, the question is how brilliant is the idea? The Despande Center wanted a brilliant idea, but one that also looked like it had the potential for commercialization. The committee to do that not only consisted of a skewed group of faculty who knew things about entrepreneurship and, and uh, innovation and commercialization, but MIT alum venture capitalists participated in judging which faculty members should receive that. The Despande Center was done collaboratively with the MIT Entrepreneurship Center. The press release explicitly said, the Despande Center will cooperate with the MIT Entrepreneurship Center to assist faculty in moving their ideas to the market. The very first course that we created, we being Charlie Cooney from Chemical Engineering, who was the first director for a long while of the Despande Center and me, we created a course called Innovation Teams. It was the first course joint between Sloan School students and engineering school students. It took an idea from the faculty member coming through the Despande Center, brought it to the classroom, and a student team, 50-50 engineers, 50-50 uh, Sloan students, would take that faculty research idea and move it all away from worrying about intellectual property and how good's the technology and what's the competition and what's it going to take to develop it and the funding and you name it. And at the end of the semester, the team working on a faculty idea would make a recommendation, send it back for more research. It's an okay idea for a product enhancement or process enhancement for an existing company, or it's a great idea to start a new company. And if it was a great idea to start a new company, high likelihood, the student team sometimes with the faculty member would enter the MIT 50K competition or 100K competition, whatever was going on at that time. So this was the second of the additions that took place, 2002. 2006, the Sloan School made a judgment that there was enough interest in entrepreneurship to create the entrepreneurship and innovation track. I was the head of that track until this year. I'm now the co-leader with Scott Stern of the ENI track. The ENI track has been very popular, the most popular track in the Sloan School. Rod Garcia, our director of admissions, has said that for years, more than 50% of the applicants to the Sloan School say in their application that they're primarily interested in coming to MIT because of the entrepreneurial environment and because of the chance to forward their own thinking in entrepreneurship. Uh, in the areas of this crazy year of the pandemic, 
when we weren't constrained by classroom size as to how big a class could be, over 200 of the entering 400 MBA students enrolled in the entrepreneurship and innovation track. So that was 2006. In 2007, the last of what we call the MIT entrepreneurial ecosystem got started. That was the Legatum Center for Developmental Entrepreneurship and Innovation. The Legatum Center was initially placed in the Urban Studies Department. It was the only one that had a focus on developing countries. Now it's much more free floating, but again, developed with the collaboration and work of the MIT Entrepreneurship Center. As a result, as of 2007, we had four MIT organizations focused on entrepreneurship. The MIT Entrepreneurship Center, the Venture Mentoring Center, the, the Deshpande Center for Technological Innovation, the Legatum Center for Development and, uh, and Entrepreneurship. Those four centers began to work closely together as a cluster and we called ourselves the MIT Entrepreneurial Ecosystem. And we were delighted that we were collaborative. We would meet periodically together. We would rotate our sites so we would get to know more about what's going on in every program. We did all of that kind of stuff. Okay, much more then happened at MIT after 2007, a lot of new things. The most recent you know about is the MIT engine, which is a great new move by MIT to foster entrepreneurship and breakthrough entrepreneurship. Okay, what's the impact we've had on MIT? I told you that in the beginning, there was one course. That one course that we had in 1961 typically enrolled 12 to 15 students a semester. We have the same course today, New Enterprises, same course, but we teach two sections each semester and we have an enrollment in that course of around 300 students a year. In addition, we have enrollment in 60 courses in entrepreneurship all across MIT of about a thousand students a year a very different kind of impact upon MIT at the student activity level. Let me give you a different kind of a number. In 1932, from our own data, staff people leaving MIT research labs, average in age, 32 years of age, faculty people setting up their own companies in 2000 and in 1965, average age of faculty with 38. Why the difference between 32 and 38? Answer? Nobody in his right mind as a faculty member would start a company before he got tenure and tenure was awarded at about age 37 or 38. If you started a company sooner, then other people will think you weren't serious about being a real true academic at MIT. So almost all faculty obeyed that algorithm, except me. In 1963, at the same time I was starting my research on entrepreneurship, I went in to see my boss. My boss was Jay Forrester, the head of system dynamics. And that's where I was the senior grad student in system dynamics. And I said, Jay, Jack Pugh and I have decided we're gonna start a consulting firm in system dynamics. We wanna spread the word. We wanna help other people outside, learn what we know and start to do system dynamics and do things. Forrester looked up at me from his desk in anger and said the magic words. Ed, some people will feel you're not serious about an academic career. That was 1963. This is 2021. I'm still here. So sometimes mistakes are made. Uh, okay. It, today, as another indication of change, Susan Hockfield, our beloved former president of MIT, is running a thing called Founders Forum. It is aimed at young female faculty in the life sciences to educate them and help persuade them that they should be starting new companies in biotechnology and the life sciences. So from 1961, 62, 63, when it was anathema for a faculty member to start a company till today, when the former president of MIT is urging faculty to go ahead and start companies. That's a big kind of shift. I'll give you another kind of shift. The Dean for Undergraduate Admissions says, more than 50% of those applying to MIT say they would like to start a company before they graduate from MIT. This is a very different MIT we have. The first thing we talked about is the impact 
the impact we have had first is on MIT culture. It's dramatically changed. And I want to go to my book, Celebrating Entrepreneurs, How MIT Nurtured Pioneering Entrepreneurs Who Started Great Companies, and turn to the back page and quote the present president of MIT, Raphael Reif. And Raphael Reif says, an entrepreneurship tornado continues to blow at MIT. The energy of entrepreneurship rises through our classrooms, labs, and centers. It has been central to who we are as an institution for 50 years of extraordinary service and achievement. The president of MIT today, very different MIT than the MIT all of you went to if you went more than 10, 15 years ago. Okay, turn to the second impact. The impact is economic impact of MIT entrepreneurship system locally and on the United States. First, the numbers, then we'll talk about the people. In the 1980s, our estimates from our research indicate that about 6,000 new companies were started by MIT alumni. In the decade of the 2000s, we estimate that over 12,000 new companies were started by MIT alumni. In the decade just finished, the decade of the 2010s, our estimate is that over 25,000 new companies were started during that decade by MIT alums. In 2015, we published our second study of all of MIT alumni focusing upon entrepreneurship. What we found was that in 2014, our last complete data year, there were more than 30,200 living companies by living alumni. That's very important terminology. The companies hadn't died. The companies hadn't been sold off. The companies hadn't merged into. The alumni hadn't died. These were living alumni with living companies, 30,200 companies alive in 2014. Those companies employed 4.6 million people worldwide. The overall revenues of those companies was $2 trillion. In 2014, $2 trillion was the equivalent of the 10th largest economy in the world. That's right. MIT living alumni and their living companies in 2014 were doing the economic impact of the equivalent of the 10th largest nation in the world. Okay, uh, we can go on with more data. Let me instead now turn to people. And in turning to people, I'm gonna really turn to the contents of this book. Because in this book, what I decided to do was not focus on people who were building companies, but rather focus on people who were essentially building pioneering companies, companies that were creating wholly new industries. There are four chapters in the book that are deep dives. The deep dives are number one, biotechnology and life sciences. Number two, the internet. Number three, from CAD CAM to robotics. Number four, to be very different, modern finance. Okay, let's start at the beginning life sciences and biotechnology. What do I wanna show you? I wanna show you that these industries were started by MIT alum and MIT alums were the ones who created these bold new critical industries. Life sciences and biotechnology, the first company, Bob Swanson, co-founder, two degrees from MIT, found a partner out in California. The first company, Genentech, started in California. The first company in Cambridge, started by Professor Phil Sharp, Nobel Prize winner, professor of biology, first company, Biogen, formed a block be, a, a, a bound around MIT. You couldn't build anything near MIT, and you then had to worry about the, the regional development area that was vacant. You had to build beyond that to find a place for Biogen. That's where its headquarters are even today. The next company I talk about in that chapter is not a company, it's a person, Bob Langer. Because of the Langer Laboratory, the largest lab at MIT, Bob Langer has co-founded more than 40 companies coming out of his lab with his lab associates, with his junior faculty, with his research associates, with his research assistants, over 40 companies, one guy who has done this thing. And then we go on in the chapter, and the, uh, there's a person that maybe you now know if you've been watching the 11 o'clock news in the greater Boston area, and that person is Nubar Afayan. 
Yomara Fayan is MIT's first PhD in biotechnology processing. In his last semester as a PhD student, he came over and he took my course in corporate entrepreneurship, the only management course Neubauer has ever taken. He made up for it much later. He gave us as a freebie over 10 years worth as a senior lecturer teaching entrepreneurship in the MIT Entrepreneurship Center. So Neubauer has been a really great contributor to our entrepreneurship ecosystem. But Nubar came back to Boston after starting a first successful biotech company, came back to Boston and started a venture capital firm. The venture capital firm got named Flagship Ventures, and then he changed the name of the company. The company is now called Flagship Pioneering. Why? Because the basic focus of the company is to create pioneering new companies in new fields of biotechnology that haven't been seen before as being susceptible to creation and commercialization. And Nubar is CEO and chair of Flagship Pioneering, but you may know him from the fact that he is also chair of Moderna. And Moderna was spun out of Flagship Pioneering just one year ago, about three months before suddenly the pandemic called upon Moderna to become one of the salvation sources for America. We can go on. That's the chapter on biotech and life sciences. By the way, in all of those chapters, it's not me talking, it's them talking. We have them in in-depth interviews recorded, and we have them in the documents that they've written. So you're reading what they have had to say, not what I say about them. Okay, next chapter, the internet. In the internet, we have an outrageous alum named Bob Metcalf. Bob Metcalf is a great guy. He's got two degrees from MIT in electrical engineering and in management. By the way, that's an interesting pattern that we see repeated. Uh, engineering and management degrees from MIT or engineering from MIT and management from someplace else is characteristic of a lot of our entrepreneurial alums. Bob Metcalf is the holder of the patents on the ethernet fundamental to the internet technology and the founder CEO of 3Com, one of the great companies in the internet area. Bob says in a lot of areas, there's a big fight about who are the real fathers of innovation that are responsible for all this. He says in the internet area, you don't have to worry. All of the people who contributed to the founding of the internet are MIT alum. And then in the chapter, we focus on the government agency that made this possible, which was DARPA. The leadership of DARPA in the area of the internet were all MIT alums. The company that was contracted to do the principal development work, Bolt, Veronica, and Newman, MIT spin-off company. The people inside of BBNN who had all the critical roles in charge of the project, in charge of all the contributions to the internet development and the first machines that were developed, all MIT alum, it's all documented in the book. The first companies that were created when commercialization of this new technology was allowed by communications rules and regulations in Washington, first company was a company called Telenet, spun out of BBNN. And then we have another company that some of you may remember, AOL, co-founded again by an MIT alum. So we have that and then you go a little bit further downstream, you know, it takes a couple of years, and then you have Akamai. Akamai is an interesting company. It's located around the corner from MIT next to the Marriott Hotel. Akamai carries 30% of the world's traffic on the internet worldwide. Early stage formation. By the way, they even came out of the 50K competition with where the related faculty member was working with undergraduate students as well as grad students to try to see if they could create something worthwhile. And then one final thing to talk about in the chapter on the internet, and that is the first internet company in China, Sohu.com, co-founded in 1996 by Charles Zhang, a PhD in physics, and me. So in 1996, we created the first internet company in China. I stayed on the board for 20 years. Finally, after 20 years, I decided it's time for me to make room for somebody else. I was the only non-Chinese member of the board out of courtesy 
they conducted the board meetings in English with translation being on very rapidly for those Chinese who didn't speak English. Anyway, very interesting experience. Okay, next chapter. From CAD CAM to robotics. Okay, let's start with CAD CAM. CAD CAM is very interesting. The first two companies in the field were both MIT spinoffs started in the same month in the same city of Bedford, Massachusetts. One company formed by four electrical engineering PhDs out of Lincoln Lab. The other company formed by a mechanical engineer named Phil Villers and that company was Computer Vision. The first company was Applicon. They didn't know of each other. They didn't know that each other existed until they finally got into the same business. Those two companies were the first ones. But it's really interesting because you go one step beyond that to another MIT guy, John Herstick. Herstick. John Herstick started his first company in the CAD CAM area as an undergraduate. He took the new enterprises course with a guy named Bolt of Bolt Innovation later on. That company was a CAD CAM company. Interestingly, Harvard Management Company put a million dollars into it. The company went, went belly up, but Herstick didn't go belly up. Herstick came back and started a company called SolidWorks. If you know anything about the CAD CAM field, SolidWorks is still today the dominant three-dimensional software in the field of CAD CAM and the like. So you have that kind of thing taking place in the fundamentals. Okay. Now we start moving past CAD CAM to its implications for robotics. And when we turn to robotics, if you've been around MIT, the first name you think of is you think of Rod Brooks who headed the robotics area in CSAIL in electrical engineering. And Rod Brooks with two of his students, Helen Greiner and Colin Angle formed the first commercially oriented robotics company, iRobot. And their vacuum cleaner product was the first commercially oriented robotics company. Colin Angle is still CEO of that company. Helen went off to start other companies after that. So that was the first of one kind of robotics. Well, there's other kinds of robotics. Mick Mounts, a mechanical engineer, started with a bunch of his fraternity brothers from MIT, a company that was robotics all over the place because it was doing pick and, and pack for online companies that were trying to ship significantly. His company was called Kiva Systems. Well, Kiva Systems was quickly bought by Amazon and became Amazon Robotics. And again, we have the movement of a pioneering new approach to a new field from MIT alums. Now let me go to the next stage of robotics. And what is that? It's autonomous vehicles, where robotics are being applied to running things. And what became the dominant company in the robotics field that invented and developed all the major technology that then fed all the major automotive companies, that company is a company formed by two mechanical engineering PhDs. The CEO founder is Amnon Shashua, an Israeli. And the company is Mobileye, which became the dominant supplier to all the automotive industries of all the technology that underlie autonomous vehicles. Now, having been bought by Intel and still in Israel and still led by Amnon Shashua, it still is the dominant player in the field. So that's that chapter and more discussion. Now let's turn to the last chapter that really gets a deep dive. And I specifically picked modern finance because I wanted to show that the role of MIT pioneering entrepreneurs is not limited just to areas that come out of the engineering school or the science school. And what you see in the area of modern finance is a very different kind of story, but not different in terms of pioneering. Okay, I divide the chapter into three clusters, venture capital, quantitative investing and trading, and electronic trading. Venture capital, the first venture capital company in the world is American Research and Development Company. What a weird company name. Started by MIT, chairman of the corporation and former president, Carl Taylor Compton. The advisory group, three MIT engineering school department heads. MIT was an initial investor in American Research and Development Company. The most successful investment it ever made was in digital equipment company. Ken Olson and Harlan Anderson coming out of Lincoln Laboratory to create the pioneering firm in the mini computer field. Okay, we go beyond the first company and we say who else was there in the start of the field? We find a bunch of other MIT alums. So uh, people like 
Tom Klein, Tom Perkins of Kleiner Perkins. Uh, let me think uh, who, uh, uh, funny name, uh, bah, 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 bah. DuBose Montgomery of Menlo Ventures, David Morgenthaler of Morgenthaler Capital. All of these MIT alums were early stage venture capitalists, okay? Now, then they did something else. They weren't satisfied with building venture capital in the United States. MIT people carried venture capital overseas to other MIT receivers and who started venture capital elsewhere. The founder of modern venture capital in Japan, an MIT alum. The founders of MIT of modern venture capital in China, in Hong Kong, MIT alums. All this illustrated and described and discussed in their own words in that chapter on modern finance. Okay, now turn to quantitative investing, second area. In quantitative investing, you got a lot of different areas of investing. Helmut Weimar, PhD from MIT in economics, my old research assistant in system dynamics, formed a company called Commodities Corporation. His PhD committee included Paul Samuelson. Paul Samuelson became an advisor and investor in Commodities Corporation. Commodities Corporation eventually was sold to Goldman Sachs. You now go to quantitative portfolio management. Somebody like Gary Bergstrom, a PhD in finance from the Sloan School, was somebody who formed and developed one of the biggest companies in the area that did quantitative portfolio management. You go to the area of quantitative investing in the portfolios, and you certainly don't want to forget Jim Simons. Jim Simons, after whom now the building that houses the math department that trained him is now named as the Simons Building, Jim Simons is the founder of Renaissance Technologies, the highest performing investment firm in the world in terms of return on investment. And we certainly wouldn't want to leave him off the list. And then we go to electronic trading. Well, wait a minute, electronic trading? Is there a field of electronic trading? And you think about it, you can only think of one company, E-Trade. Ah, E-Trade the company formed by Bill Porter, Sloan School master's degree. And by the way, Bill also formed an international trading firm which merged with somebody else, but E-Trade still exists and still is the dominant electronic trading company. So what we have with four deep dives is evidence that essentially says that MIT alums have been the people who have pioneered one after another major new industry. And it's all described with much more data in the book and hearing them talk about the problems, the incidents, what they did, what they didn't do, the mistakes they made and the like. Okay, Susan Hockfield, when she was president of MIT would talk frequently about this wonderful square mile. And the wonderful square mile was Kendall Square, including MIT. And she would say, it is phenomenal. It has the most dense population of PhD scientists of any square mile in the world. But what has happened in terms of the last 50 years is that that square mile has expanded. And it's now expanded to cover all of Cambridge and Arlington and Somerville and Newton. And it's even given the rebirth to Waltham and Lexington, which used to be the heart of Route 128 and then died away. But the rebirth of Kendall Square and the information technology and life sciences companies that were born and bred there from MIT alums primarily has hit, had this kind of a dramatic economic impact on the entire local area and on the United States. So I indicated the kind of thing we've done numerically. I've indicated a whole series of examples of companies that have come out of MIT in a way and now let me just finish off with talking about impact on the rest of the world. And I'll just take five minutes to do it. Okay, first, 20% of the MIT companies are outside the United States. Secondly, 50% of the students in entrepreneurship and innovation are foreign born students with the likelihood that they will return to their own countries, many of them. If you look at MIT programs by organizations, we can go through the long list, the MIT Enterprise Forum I already talked about, the Global Startup Workshop, every year teaching hundreds of people all around the world how to replicate what goes on at MIT. The Entrepreneurial Development Program, it's been there since 1999. 
Now it's sponsored by a half a dozen countries to send their people to learn about how to build companies. Venture Mentoring Service is supported primarily by its global outreach, where it supports 60 units around the world to teach them how to run venture mentoring programs. The REAP program, Regional Entrepreneurial Acceleration Program, we started it in 2011, a two-year program. We take eight regions a year. We help them build their regions in an entrepreneurial way. We can then go to country programs. Country programs run by schools of MIT, engineering in particular, and Sloan, or by MIT overall, engineering. Uh, did a lot of really good stuff in Singapore, in the United Arab Emirates, in Portugal, and in other places. The Sloan School has done an amazing amount of things in China, all the Chinas, mainland China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan. We've done it in all those places. United Arab Emirates, Portugal, Malaysia, Tokyo, Kyushu. These are all Sloan School programs. MIT as a whole did Skolkovo in Russia. Now, not every one of these programs succeeds but we've had a great success. And let me end by saying the following, the MIT entrepreneurship ecosystem has done far more to affect the world and has had far greater impact than any other university's entrepreneurial programs. It took 50 years for us to build the unique MIT entrepreneurial ecosystem in the process and now. We dramatically changed the culture and the resources of MIT. We have hugely affected the economies of greater Cambridge and the United States. And we have brought effective entrepreneurial education and development to the rest of the world. I will stop there and I'm open to any kinds of questions or issues you'd like to bring up. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, that was wonderful. And I find myself thinking how fortunate that you came to MIT because I suspect that the MIT entrepreneurial community would not have flourished the way that it has without your influence. And I also like to think that um, MIT certainly is a very special place and what you have been able to accomplish at MIT might not have been accomplished at other places. So I'd like to start with a question. Um, why did you come to MIT? What made you choose MIT as the place to pursue your education and your career? I was a somewhat poor boy in Chelsea and I went to the tech course in Chelsea High School, which was for at Chelsea High, the elite program to prepare you to go to MIT. So it was us as smart kids who were interested in math and science and uh, Three of us applied to MIT in 1953 when I was graduating from Chelsea High School. Two of us got accepted and attended MIT. The third one unfortunately got turned down and had to go to Harvard. Uh, so that's why I came to MIT, but I came to MIT because from at least the sixth grade on, I said I wanted to become an engineer. In the sixth grade, I said I wanted to become a civil engineer and build tall buildings and big bridges. By the time I was in high school, computers were coming along. I had no idea what computers really were, but they sounded fascinating. And so when I applied to MIT, I said I wanted to be in course six in electrical engineering and I wanna study computers. And I did. And while I overloaded in management and economics, even as an undergraduate and grad student, then then got, I got two degrees in electrical, then a master's in Sloan, a PhD in economics. Nevertheless, as far as I'm concerned, I'm a course six guy and I got my underlying background and how I think and how I do things and how I approach problems comes from five years of working in the toughest engineering department at MIT, course six. And I love it and how, I love it now. How fortunate that you did come to MIT. So we started receiving a number of questions. I'd like to remind people that if you have a question you'd like to pose, please put it in the Q and A box. And I'd like to start with one of the questions that came in. How can MIT alums or entrepreneurs contribute back to the MIT entrepreneurial ecosystem? What's the best way to do that while building their companies and afterwards? Well, the first thing you can do is you can consider giving us some money. Uh, we really can use money. We frankly, we struggle every year to balance our budget and we get some money from the Sloan School, we don't get any money from Central MIT. 
So the only other money we get, we get from our own endowment. Our endowment is presently at $23 million. That doesn't produce a huge amount of income. If our endowment were $50 million, it would really make life a lot easier. So you could do that. But secondly, we've had a lot of help from MIT alums who have volunteered to come in and be senior lecturers. Mubarak Fayan was an example, but we've had a lot of senior lecturers who are unpaid because they are doing their own thing and having fun. We have a bunch of people that are hangarounds. Bill Owlett was a hanger on. He was a Sloan grad. And when he finished his third company, he came to me and said, Ed, I don't have an idea for a next company and I'd like to help out in some way. What can I do? Can I hang around the trust center? It was then the trust center already, not the MIT Entrepreneurship Center. I said, what will you do? He says, I'll help in any way I can. We have a half a dozen people like that, most of whom are MIT alums. They are hanging around and they're terribly helpful in what they're doing. Uh, so, so that's a important way one can contribute. Now, let me go beyond that because just yesterday, I was participating in a conversation with people from the Northern California uh, Alumni Association, and they were discussing creating an MIT alumni startup organization for people who have built companies and who now wanted to associate with each other and help each other but figure out ways of helping MIT. And we're just in the early stages of starting to think through those ideas. So I would encourage alumni to, you can send them to me, you can send them to Bonnie, but send them to somebody so that we know you're interested. And if you have ideas that you think would be worth pursuing, we'd love to hear from you. Right now, the staff and the leadership of the Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship is overwhelmed with work. We have in the past year lost three staff members. MIT rules this year were you can't replace staff. So consequently, we've been trying to get things done with a much smaller staff available to get those things done, but we've done a lot of stuff and uh, any help that we could get would be, would be wonderful. So that's some starting points, but come up with your own ideas. You're from MIT, you get lots of ideas. All right, thanks, Ed. Um, we have somebody else who has asked you to remind us who were the other founders of the Entrepreneurship Center who worked with you? There weren't any. Founding the center? I did it. Uh, and I did it against opposition. Uh, in the second meeting I had with my dean, because the first meeting ended with uh, a question, his question was, Ed, who besides you thinks this is a good idea? And I got up, I won't mention the Dean. I got up, I reached over, I took the proposal off his desk. I said, I'll be back. And a month later I came back and I tossed the proposal on his desk and I said, don't bother rereading it. It's the same proposal, turn it over gently and look at the last page. And he said, well, okay. And he looks at it, last page was a signature page. In the month I had convinced every group head in the Sloan School organization behavior, economics, finance, marketing, to sign off on the proposal. But there was nobody else who was my partner. Every other group had agreed, this is a good idea. And the Dean looked at it and said, okay, Ed, what are we going to do now? And I said, I love the we. And that's where we started. So we started to build a cadre and the building was when I had permission that I could start to go out and start to recruit people. The first person I recruited and brought on board was Scott Stern uh, in 1993. The next one was Scott Shane, who didn't make it at MIT, but became head of entrepreneurship at Maryland. And then he's still head of entrepreneurship at Case Western. The third person I hired was Fiona Murray, who still is at MIT. So this was a gradual process of building faculty. With every new faculty member was the demand, come up with ideas for new courses. And we started rolling out courses. And once we really built a center with some strength, that course loading and rolling became something that we began to do across all of MIT. So, I mean, that's took a long time. That's why I say it was 50 years. It was 20 years, well, it was more. It was 27 years until we had an organization called the MIT Entrepreneurship Center. And it's been 
24 years since then of building the ecosystem with all of the other constituent parts. And the great thing is we really collaborate well with each other. We really see ourselves as partners. I could cite a very well-known uh, institution on the other side of the country that has exactly the opposite situation. They have two entrepreneurship centers, one in the engineering school and one in the business school, and they hate each other. And that's not the situation that we have been able, thankfully, to develop at MIT. So it took a lot of patience to build confidence and relationships, and that's been the heart of what we have. So now, all kinds of people deserve credit for what we're presently doing. But it would have been a lot more comfortable if I had somebody else to talk to than just my own graduate students and the like. So, Well, I come back to how fortunate that you came to MIT. Um, we have a couple questions related to the comment that you just made. Um, one question is, does the biotech nature of Boston today affect MIT's entrepreneurial nature and direction? And do certain industries verticals require proximity to the West Coast entrepreneurial clusters? And then we have a couple of related questions of, if I was in Silicon Valley, um, would I hear the same story only about Stanford or does MIT crush Stanford in these areas? And another person who commented being an alum of both MIT and Stanford, I cannot resist to ask, how does Stanford compare with MIT? So you, you did just comment about okay. one of the differences. Um, Those are excellent questions and deserve good answers. And we can only give halfway answers. So first of all, when we did the first study of all MIT alum, first time anybody ever studied the alum, total alumni body of a university, we studied it in 2009. My research is that my PhD student was Chuck Easley. When Chuck Easley finished his PhD, uh, we did two things. One, we started the first study of Tsinghua University, the MIT of China, and Chuck then took it over as he went to Stanford as a new assistant professor. And at Stanford, he got an assignment. The assignment was replicate the MIT study. That was unusual. One usually give an assignment to a new assistant professor. Anyway, uh, if you took the Stanford report and put it page by page with the MIT report, you would say, hey, both these universities are doing very kinds, very comparable kinds of things, particularly in output. So if we lay, which Chuck and I did, if we lay on one graph, the growth of MIT alumni companies and the growth of Stanford alumni companies, and we have a blue line for Stanford and a red line for MIT, the curves overlap each other almost all the way up. So in terms of growth of output, the growths look very much the same, but the institutions are very different. And I told you about one of the critical aspects of the institutional differences. We have a collaborative institution, but now there's a second much more important difference. The kinds of outputs are very different. The primary output of Stanford in new enterprises is software and media oriented companies. The primary outputs from MIT are tangible science and technology across all fields. So MIT is much more a place of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, of science and technology. Stanford, for all of its wonders, is not. Stanford is an institution whose software is terribly one-dimensional. In the report written by Chuck Easley on the Stanford data that he collected, he says the largest number of companies coming out of Stanford are media-oriented software companies. So we're different places. If you want to start a media-oriented company, probably the best place to do it is in California. Well, by the way, I'm not so sure California is the best place to start anything today, but that has been the best place to start things. California has had a lot of misfortune occurring to it economically and environmentally. And there's a lot of people who are now thinking about leaving California. But 
Stanford's a great institution and there are other great institutions to parallel Stanford. If you're a graduate of both MIT and Stanford, well, we, I know right away, you're a very smart person and you're a very accomplished person. Uh, by the way, what I have learned in 60 years at MIT is to admire the capabilities of the people who are my students and my former students and the like, just an awful lot of very smart people. And the faculty are very smart. By the way, the faculty are biased. We think the smartest people at MIT are the undergraduates. Uh, but you know, we could do a survey and ask that question. I'm quite sure that that would be the answer that would turn up, that the undergrads are the, are the smartest ones at MIT. And now what I said is an intriguing thing. The head of admissions says that half of the undergraduate applicants are now saying they want to start their first company before they graduate from MIT. That's mind boggling. And what kinds of companies will they start? Somebody is going to do a study of what has happened during the pandemic. And they're going to have a tough time gathering the data because it's difficult to assemble. But what they're going to be able to show is that enormous amounts of innovation and entrepreneurial activity came out of everybody and their uncles during this period of time in many institutions. And at MIT, we were getting daily memos talking about every different part of MIT, what's newly happening in discovery and development and application and support. And, and so it just really, it stimulated massive kinds of responsiveness. And I'm sure that similar things have been happening at many institutions around the country, but so far undocumented by anybody in a systematic way. I, I probably have only answered a piece, of the, a piece of the question. If there's another piece, we can get back to it. Or maybe there's another question we ought to turn to. Well, I'd actually like to follow up. Speaking of Chuck Eastley, we have a question from Chuck Eastley, ah. um, who says, if you had a magic wand and you could remove one thing from the entrepreneurial ecosystem, what barrier, what project, what word or concept, what would you subtract and what would you add? What would I subtract? Uh, the subtraction's hard. The, the, the part that I think is presently our major strength across campus is Delta V, our own accelerator program, run competitively across the campus. And by budget, we can't afford to support more than 25 teams each year but it's terrific. It is a major grooming source for real entrepreneurship coming out at the student level and the like. And by the way, one of the things we credit in applying for that is the presence of people from more than one MIT department. We strongly encourage cross-disciplinary teams and the like. So that's something I would say is a present major strength of it. A second major strength is over 60, 60 subjects across MIT. I mean, we cover the gamut and we now have a lot of different people making their contributions in different ways uh, to this. The Dean of Engineering at one time said, well, you don't do entrepreneurship, but we do innovation. Every engineer is an innovator. Well, I don't know about that, but in any event, you know, MIT does have a heart in which coming up with ideas and trying to move ideas forward is fine. Uh, I could say the following, I think we are no longer men's at manas because manas is too soft a word. We are now men's at entre and entrepreneurship because men's at manas merely says that you're gonna take the ideas you have and try to put them to work. But today, the primary mechanism for putting them to work is starting a company that is going to really be built and you're there doing the building. This is a dramatic change of culture that matters. And that's, I think, the most important today asset of MIT, not of the Entrepreneurship Center per se, of MIT. Now, what would I take away? Uh, I would take away a good chunk of the 50 of the 27 years I spent doing this alone. Uh, we would have been way ahead had had there, been, had there been today's attitude when I was trying to do this stuff. Because I have to tell you, I had no senior faculty support of what I was doing. Fortunately, I was a rate buster 
And I learned how to be a rate buster from the beginning. You just have to bust your ass in a typical MIT way. You work on 10 things at the same time and the like. I continued doing system dynamics work. I wrote a bunch of books on system dynamics because I was taught by Jay Forrester and I, I led the field except for what he did himself. I did that. And then I co-founded the field at MIT of managing research and development and technical innovation. That was without entrepreneurship. And I continue to do a lot of stuff on managing R&D. The people who support MIT in the industrial liaison program are basically the vice presidents of research and engineering of the major corporations. Those people would come into our office because we had the group focusing on them and their problems, how to manage R&D organizations and the like. They would say to me, hey, Ed, the work you're doing for us is really terrific. That's great stuff. We're really interested in what you're doing on R&D management. Why are you wasting your time on these little companies? Only around here in 128 and a little bit out there in Silicon Valley do you have clusters of companies like this. Who cares? You ought to pay all your time and attention on us big guys and what we need to understand better about doing more effective research and development activities. And I would smile and I would say, uh, I appreciate your point of view. And I am continuing to do my work in R&D and my group is continuing to work in R&D. But I personally think that entrepreneurship is neat stuff. And I like doing work in that area. And that was it. And of course, I changed from being a two year assistant, a second year assistant professor in 63 to getting early tenure. Well, once you have tenure, you're your own boss. I mean, you really are in that you can call your own shots. Nobody is gonna tell you what to do once you have tenure. They will ask you what you're interested in. They will ask if you can get support for what you're interested in, particularly if you need money to support research assistants or grad students and the like. Engineering school doesn't function without supporting their grad students, each professor being able to do it. But they no longer think they ought to direct you in terms of what you wanna do. So once I had tenure, I wasn't criticized by my senior faculty. I was questioned by outsiders, but the senior faculty let me do what I felt like doing. But notice in 1990, when I brought the story to the Dean, the Dean said, come on, Ed, why do you really wanna waste your time with these kinds of people? And I said, what kind of people? And he wrinkled up his face and said, you know, entrepreneurs and you know that was a clue that said that okay there's somebody but but the deans don't control the faculty so it was okay we and and we had a very good personal relationship so it's fine so i mean i other than speeding up the time period where people were willing to accept the notion of entrepreneurship as a way of life was the only thing that would have been a wonderful subtraction if we could have gotten it out of the way sooner. I don't have any reason to think that we wouldn't have achieved everything we've achieved today 20 years sooner. Uh, I, I don't know, the world didn't change around us in any dramatic way as far as I'm concerned. Might have been with different technologies that we would be pioneering, but the pioneering spirit is an MIT spirit once you get people to understand that this is something they can pull off. Well, thank goodness you've wasted your time over the years with those kind of people. I've enjoyed it. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions that are related. Um, the first is from Carrie Bowie. Um, the number of women entrepreneurs receiving VC funding is approximately three to 4%. And the percentage for African-American founders is in the 1% range. Yeah. Is there any data showing that MIT women and or African-American alums are doing any better? And if not, are you aware of anything MIT is doing to change this? And before you answer that question, let me also share a related question. Um, <clears throat> this is from Peck So. I'm curious as to whether you observe an increase in the number of female faculty and alumni in starting new companies. Are female entrepreneurs more likely to start companies later in their careers than male counterparts? Okay. So that hits uh, the current weakness of entrepreneurial activity around the world. 
And we are no different from every place else in the world, we being the United States, and we at MIT are no different from the rest of the United States. So if you want to see the admissions of guilt, go to the book. And if you go to the book, you'll find that I published the data on what we know about female participation in entrepreneurship from our quantitative surveys where we surveyed everybody and the like, what we know from the data formally, and what we see as the trends today. Okay, now in the last chapter of this book, I talk about the future of entrepreneurship. Among other things, I talk about a lot of new companies that I didn't mention. So I did deep dives on four industries. I then do, in a way, not so deep, but dives into a whole bunch of other companies and other industries, HubSpot, PillPack, Okta, a lot of companies that are there and described. I go in depth into four companies, all of which represent exactly the kinds of problem issues that you are describing. They are four companies in which the dominant color of the founders is black and the dominant gender of the founders is female. And I take those four companies, by the way, the dominant location is outside the United States uh, and talk about those companies individually. And they talk about it. The founders talk about how they came into it, what they did, what the problems were that they're overcoming and the like. Okay, that's to indicate that we see that maybe there are trends. We can see it in our classroom enrollments. In the membership in the Delta V teams, we are now seeing increased, meaningfully increased numbers of women, undergraduate and graduate, in the teams that are winning a place in Delta V, our, our biggest honor and our most important contribution to future development. Are we solving the problem? We are like hell. Uh, we're contributing to trying to make advances in the problem. We haven't got a grasp on it in terms of numbers. There are relatively few, there are not relatively few women at MIT. Now there's 50% of the undergraduates are women. So we're getting more women enrollments. Now in the Sloan School, there's almost 50% of Sloan master students who are women. More and more women are showing up in the entrepreneurship classes and in the e &I track, that's good. But we're still talking small numbers. So if we have, if we have 200 women in Sloan MBA program, okay, how many of them are gonna become entrepreneurs? Well, I mean, 30 of them, that's great but not 200 of them. So we have our work to do. We know this. We really are trying very hard to do it. And to answer Peck So's question, uh, I don't think that we're finding that women are starting their companies at later points in their careers. We used to think that. We thought that they were pausing for childbirth and marriage. Turns out that in the last study we did with 2,000 and 14 data, uh, we tested that. No significant difference between married women and unmarried women in their formation of new companies. No significant difference between childbearing ages and non-childbearing ages in women starting companies. So hypotheses that seemed reasonable didn't show up as being statistically meaningful once we had some amounts of data. If we had much more data, maybe we would find better and more clear results. So I think the issue relates to something that at MIT, we have a new head of DEI uh, that where we're trying to work the issues of, of uh, representation by gender, by, by uh, race and the like. And that new head uh, said to me that Ed, we understand that merely having MIT do advanced programs for juniors in high school and seniors in high school to make them better able to come into MIT, which MIT has been doing for a long time. He says, we really do understand that if you go past junior high school and beginning to orient people towards math and science, it's probably already too late. Well, we have to wait for the rest of the world to come around to doing something in junior high school that is going to change the environment of acculturating women and minorities and like. Uh, we do have a minimal amount of data from MIT's own experience that Hispanics do better than blacks in terms of 
this kinds of transition, but not terribly better. So, I mean, it's, a, it's broader than merely one kind of racial issue. It's really dealing with a larger group of minorities. Now, there are other minorities where it's totally different. The Chinese at MIT used to be a minority. I don't know where they are now. The Indians at MIT used to be a minority. The Indian Indians, not the American Indians, used to be a minority. I don't know what the numbers are now, but there's absolutely no shortage of Indian and Chinese entrepreneurs and activists in every area of MIT. So there are things that go back to the cultural underpinnings of these people that matter. I strongly believe that among other things, immigrants are showing up increasingly as entrepreneurs. And there's one venture capital firm in the Boston area that I happen to have invested in. I invested in it because of the fact it only invests in companies in which one or more immigrants is a senior founding officer. The name of the company is interesting. It calls itself One Way Ventures. And when I said, what a weird name, why do you call yourself One Way Ventures? And he said, immigrants don't buy a round trip ticket. And that's a very interesting point of view. It's a very different level of commitment, motivation and drive that says, I've got to succeed. And if we can try to do something at MIT that causes the got to succeed notion to be more widespread, we will have contributed importantly to solving the problem of women as entrepreneurial minorities, blacks, Hispanics as entrepreneurial minorities, and anybody else. So we're doing things, we're not doing, it's not that we're not doing enough, it's we're not achieving enough. We're doing a lot of things, they are not achieving the kinds of outcomes we would like to be achieving. By the way, if somebody wanted to give us a big glob of money that would have to be dedicated to working on programs aimed at accelerating participation of women in these programs, we'd love to work with that kind of person and try to figure out what are the sorts of things that we could do if we had more staff, more programmatic slack and the like. The same thing would apply if we were dealing with minorities. Now we're doing those things, but we're doing those things with very little resources behind them. And none of the resources we have are dedicated. So they're all broad based and we're applying them as we can. Uh, that's an overly long answer, but to a terribly difficult question mm -hmm. that really does perplex all of us. Mm -hmm. All right, um, moving on to a couple of other related questions. Um, one is the vector that you describe for most people forming companies is primarily students plus researcher. What's the best way for mid-career alums to mix and meet professors and students incubating new businesses? And a related question from Bill Killingsworth, who took systems dynamics from you in 1969, he asks, um, you spent a good time talking about alumni, but what critical roles did faculty play in entrepreneurship? I hired Bill Killingsworth into my first consulting company. Bill Killingsworth was an aeronautical engineer who wanted to reform himself into somebody working in the management school. An example of somebody who faces a dedication and then makes it happen by dedicating himself to making it happen. That's what we're looking for throughout MIT. Okay, so the fundamental question really relates to how do we deal with non-current students and how do we relate them? The discussion at the outset that I mentioned about what we are beginning to talk about with the North Carolina, uh, North California uh, alumni chapter uh, is representative of multiple places where this concern is showing up. One of the things that I did in the conversation we had is I told them how we had tried to do the same thing years ago. We were trying to create an MIT al alumni honor society for entrepreneurs to try to pre create a vehicle of getting entrepreneurs together to share with each other and then to organizationally link to MIT. 
that didn't get off the ground because the environment at MIT didn't particularly think it was such a great idea. Today, I think the idea may be acceptable that it would be okay to do something like this. There is not today such an organization. I believe such an organization could be extraordinarily viable today in bringing alumni interested in entrepreneurship together and finding ways of creating linkages to what's happening within the campus. Now, there are a bunch of resources already available. If you go to the Trust Center website, you can find lectures, videos, you can find lots of stuff on every aspect of entrepreneurship. It's been developed for our students, but it doesn't say this is only if you are an MIT undergrad or grad student. An alumnus can just log in and go to the same videos and same things and, and see what's going on. We have not made a special effort to try to link to alumni. I think we should. The MIT Enterprise Forum was the linkage mechanism that was working for a number of years. I don't know that it's still working. By the way, I just got invited to be keynote speaker at the new Saudi Arabia MIT Enterprise Forum. I'm not sure that they know that I'm Jewish, but it's okay because I'll have a good time talking to the Saudi Arabia MIT Alumni Club about entrepreneurship. Uh, in any event, you know, the, the enterprise forum was a really good mechanism, 26 chapters around the world. Before that, when we ran out across the country, hitting eight different cities and 3,500 alumni on the question of how to start your own company, we can document how many people started companies as a result of going to that seminars. The Bob Metcalf says, that he went, to a, he went to one of these seminars, why? Because the panel included somebody that used to be the tennis coach at MIT when he was chair of the, when he was president of the tennis club at MIT. So he went there and he heard this seminar on entrepreneurship. And he said, you know, coming out of that seminar, I said, why the hell am I still staying at Xerox Park? And a year later, he had quit, set up 3Com and became a great pioneering entrepreneur in the, in the internet with the patent on the, on the, uh, on the uh, ethernet. By the way, he did the patent of the ethernet while he was an employee of Xerox Park. Xerox had no interest in commercializing it. Xerox built an internet of their own before there was an internet outside. He was part of creating the communication systems for it. That's what 3Com stood for, communications stuff. He tried to convince Xerox that they should commercialize it. They weren't interested in it. They didn't think that it meant anything. BBNN tried to convince AT&T to invest in the projects that were going on at BBNN to create the first internet at Bolt, Brannock and Newman. AT&T said, if anything worthwhile comes out of this, we're sure Bell Labs will take care of whatever it is we need to have in that area. So, I mean, it, resistance doesn't just exist at a place like MIT, it exists in large organizations that are very sure of what they're doing. At MIT, you at least have so many different places of independence. Every senior faculty member is independent. Every department has independence. People who are alums can find nodes to relate to, but it does take some activization on their part to do it. We ought to be doing more on our part to do the interfacing and to create some mechanism for making that happen. Uh, uh, again, I would say we need Slack resources to do it. We're too tight. Um, what other good questions do you have? So before the next question, I just want to share a fun fact that uh, one of our participants shared. You talked about One Way Ventures and Semyon Dukach, who was um, the founder, um, he apparently coached the MIT Blackjack team that won in Vegas, and that yes. gave him starting capital for the company. Right. Um, not necessarily the way every entrepreneur will start out, but I now you're either talking about about John Hurstick or you're talking about somebody who was one of his partners because John, there were two MIT winning Black Act teams. John was on one of them. And uh, I don't know who all the membership was, but I know that John testifies to that as a piece of his career. That was entrepreneurial too, but entrepreneurial in a way that I think we would probably frown upon if we had a chance to uh, frown upon it. So in a more serious note, and this will probably be our second to last question, um, a couple of questions related to climate change. Um, one question 
from James Stoner, if climate change and global un unsustainability threaten our species existence, what can MIT entrepreneurs initiative, what, what can MIT entrepreneurship initiatives do actively to deal with climate change and the whole global unsustainability crisis? And a related question from Alicia Main, can you speak to the entrepreneurial supports for clean tech innovators and entrepreneurs at MIT? Uh, we don't specifically support anything programmatically in terms of a given direction. We support all entrepreneurship. Now, we have courses that we've developed that are very focused. So for example, I mentioned that with Charlie Cooney, he and I created innovation teams. Well, innovation teams look like a great model of taking faculty research and getting teams of Sloan School and engineering students to work on those ideas. Once that model looked interesting, we started replicating it by field. So the next version of it was called energy ventures. And the next version of it was called healthcare ventures. And the next version of it is environmental ventures. So we took and we replicated the model, taking faculty research, putting together a course in which we're going to emphasize the entrepreneurial taking of an idea, analyzing, assessing it, and trying to move it forward downstream. So that kind of an activity has certainly taken place in the environmental area. And we've had courses in the media lab as well as in the, the Sloan School and in the engineering school that do those kinds of things for environmental questions. Now, I don't think that those courses are the primary driving forces of what's going on in environmental entrepreneurship. I think it's all the individuals in their consciousness. So I will tell you that I have observed that the current generation of students is extraordinarily environmentally sensitive and very concerned about the metrics of the environment and how it's affecting the world. They, on their own hook, are initiating actions to start companies that are more oriented toward environmental questions and environmental solution development in all areas. If you're not at MIT, you don't see all of the memos and newsletters that are coming out of MIT almost daily. If you read all of that stuff, you see what activities are happening throughout MIT. And if you merely set up a system where anything that mentioned environment was tagged and went into your inbox, you'd have stuffed inboxes very quickly of all of what's going on at MIT, entrepreneurially and not entrepreneurially, about coping with and solving entrepreneurial problems. So there's no shortage of emphasis and concern for environment, especially in the current generation of students who are the leaders of that concern. They're the ones pulling faculty to be concerned with the problems they identify as their generation's problems. So we don't need a special program on it. We need one of the many different kinds of programs that we are encouraging across, across the areas. And, uh, very, very good question. And uh, if that was Jim Stoner, I remember him well. So uh, I remember a lot of these names. And Elisa Maines, <laughs> I remember her too. <laughs> and I'd like to end with a last question. Are there one or two shared common attributes of the pioneering entrepreneurs that are possessed by the most successful elite entrepreneurs? Well, I'll start off in a simpler generalization. You shouldn't be an entrepreneur unless you have one guts and two perseverance. You really have to be dedicated to whatever it is that's your idea. And you have to realize you will fail probably in big ways or in little ways repeatedly on your path towards trying to accomplish your goals. That's the first and most important characteristic of any entrepreneur. I can't imagine that a pioneering entrepreneur who's up against the zero-ness of the surrounds in the field, that that person isn't facing an even bigger set of challenges that not only doesn't this company exist, but the field doesn't exist. Now, you know, in a modest way, if I knew what I was doing in 1963, I wouldn't have started what I was doing. I wouldn't have started entrepreneurship research, especially if I understood that people who are my bosses didn't like it. 
I would have said, oh, oh, I better do something that you're gonna like. Otherwise I don't have any career at this place. So you have to be dedicated to doing what you wanna do first, because you're gonna have big problems in, in getting it accomplished. That's number one characteristic. Beyond that, I would say anything else is relatively minor. Uh, if you have breadth of view and the like, and if you are smart enough to look for co-founders, then you probably are giving yourself a better chance of success. Our data are very clear. Solo founders, the heroes of Horatio Alger is totally baloney mythology. It doesn't exist. Solo founders lose. Teams win. Co-founder, two co-founders are considerably more likely to be successful than a solo founder. Three co-founders are more likely to be successful than two. Four are more likely to be successful than three co-founders. But at that level, we don't have a large enough sample to say that's a statistically significant finding. One to two to three are statistically significant differences. Four, the trend is there. And then beyond that, my guess is eventually you get to a team, not a company. And uh, probably you don't really want to have 10 co-founders and think that you're doing something together. You're doing something that's a, that's a mishmash, not a, uh, not a company. But I mean, that's the second thing. You don't want to do it alone. So you really want to be driven to do it. You don't want to do it alone. You want somebody else on whose shoulders you can cry. Those are my words. If you can't accept those words as legitimate characteristic of you, then you're not strong enough to be able to take on the problems of being an entrepreneur. On whose shoulders you can cry. And if you can't admit that you have the capacity to cry, you're probably not enough of a strong person to be able to go ahead and succeed. So uh, I'll just finish with one last story. When Charles Zhang, the one with whom I started Sohu.com. When Chao Zhang showed up in my office, I didn't know him except as a pretty face. I had seen him with some Chinese visitor groups. He walked in and said, Professor Roberts, can I talk with you? Sure. Come in and your name is? He says, Chao Zhang, I just got my PhD last year in physics. Oh, great. Sit down. What can I do for you? And he said, I want to go home to China and start an internet company. And I said, what did you say? And he said, I want to go home to China and start an internet. This is 1996. And I looked at him and I said, you're out of your mind. I said, I have a lot of Chinese grad students. No one wants to go home to China. They come to me, do I know anybody in the World Bank? Do I know anybody in the United Nations who can give them a three-year job to keep them out of China for, for another three years? Why do you want to go home to China? And he said, 1996, China is going to be a great nation and I want to be part of making it great. We spent the next half hour in my trying to get through what had to be baloney. I couldn't believe that. And after a half hour of grilling, I finally concluded he's serious. He really means it. And then I opened up the second channel. I said, you want to start an internet company? Really? He says, yes. I said, what do you know? And he says, I used email while I was a grad student. And I'm waiting for the rest of the sentence. And there is no rest of the sentence. Six months later, the two of us co-founded what became Sohu.com. And I raised with two other people, I raised $225,000. We put $200,000 in a bank account in Boston at what was then the first National Bank of Boston. We transferred $25,000 to the Bank of China and sent him home to try to start to figure out what kind of an internet company he would start. Charles and I incorporated the company in 19, December 1996 in Delaware. Why Delaware? It's more expensive. Why? Because I needed something that would look credible to all the people who were telling me, you're out of your mind. Start a in company in China? It's a, it's a lawless place. There is no legal system. What are you going to do starting a company in China? And I said, well, you know, I've done stupider things in my life. And by the way, my wife was supportive. She agreed I had done stupider things in my life. So that was it. And we started Sohu.com. And, you know, eventually 
we did our thing. And uh, so I, I would say you have to have that kind of a gut like Chao Zhang had. You have to have maybe a reason for having the gut. There's something you want to accomplish that's purposeful, not just that you want to accomplish it. That there's something you want to change. There's a problem that to you is a crisis and you need to solve that problem. It could be an environmental problem that's bothering the hell out of you. And if only you could do something to alter that problem, your life will be fulfilled. And if you have those kinds of feelings, then you're gonna bust your ear in trying to start a company that is going to pioneer a field where you're gonna make a difference in life. And by the way, I see social impact entrepreneurs who are trying to make social change in one or a number of ways, including the environment. I had a student named Steffi Spears. Steffi Spears started a company called Solstice. Solstice is in solar energy, but it's not to create a new solar cell. It's to broaden the ability of people to use solar cells and solar energy. Why? Because she correctly observed that you had to have a lot of money and you had to have your own house to install solar energy panels. And she said, if I can come up with a concept of community solar and convince community organizations and churches that they should participate with local groups and they should allow their structures to house the kind of solar mechanisms that can then feed solar energy to a community of membership. What an intriguing idea. And she's probably now in her 10th year of pioneering that concept around the United States and still plugging away at it. And I see this kind of thing in a lot of different fields and I admire them and the like. And by the way, there are several of us who may be a bit foolish, but we even invest in those companies because we think not necessarily that they're gonna be great successes, but that they're worthwhile helping. And uh, I think helping somebody whose motivations are so clear and so dedicated to solving a critical problem, that's a very worthwhile thing to do. And I was an early investor, Brad Feld, who was one of our great successful alums. Brad Feld is one of her early investors. And this, there's a bunch of people who would agree with me that if somebody comes along with the motivation, the charge and the identification of a critical problem and they wanna start a company to do something and they make sense, then you really need to hurt them. You need to really help them. You gotta help them do what they can do and help them with advice, help them with money, help them with time, whatever it is. So, you know, it's, a, it, it's been a lifetime for me and it's been pleasurable uh, and I've been extraordinarily satisfied by how I have spent my MIT and non-MIT time over since 1963. And I've done other things as well, but entrepreneurship has been the best of the games I've played in my judgment. Thank you for letting me come and please myself by having a chance to talk to so many MIT alumni whom I love. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you so much for spending your last two hours with us. This has been fantastic. And um, I know that many people have gotten a lot out of it. We, we have many more questions. Um, unfortunately, we don't have more time. Although I will say that Professor Roberts has agreed the to- I <laughs> the royalties all go to that, MIT, that, all, every penny. I've, I've sent in my first check for royalties for the year 2000. And I'm hoping that my check for the year 2000, 2020, I hope that the check for 2021 is gonna be much bigger than the check I wrote for 2020. So help me out. All right, thank you. And thank you so much for sharing your stories, your experience, your inspiration. Um, with us. This has been just wonderful. Um, thanks to everybody who participated. I do want to leave you with um, one of the comments in the chat from your son who says, great job, dad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is very loyal and is a terrific entrepreneur. <laughs> um, so, but thank you very much. Thanks to Megan for 
organizing this and all of the other Boston seminar series. And we hope that we'll see many of you at other events. And we're delighted to see so many people, not only from the Boston area, but from around the world um, participating in this. Um, so again, thanks so much to Professor Roberts for sharing his experience with us. And thanks to everybody for participating and have a good rest of the evening.